John Vanderbilt, I'm the Executive Director for the Loyal Economic Development Corporation. Uh, so I'm directly responsible for the county. Uh, my counterpart here is Dave Stenecker. He is the Executive Director for the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, uh, which is responsible for all of the kingdom. So whereas I've got 10 towns, he has 50 towns. Keeps him pretty busy. Um, Dave and I worked long and hard, mostly Dave, I have to say, uh, for one year and a half to uh, get the foreign trade zone extended in all of Memorial County. And we finally, after all the months, uh, were able to get officially recognized the people. Go ahead. Yeah. And uh, so we're, you know, we did do some uh, press releases and the like, let people know. I sent out all sorts of notifications. But we thought it would be useful for those companies that in particular want to really look into using this as a, an adjunct to their companies to really find out in detail what does it mean, what do you have to do, what it's going to cost you, you know, what are all the ins and outs. David was kind enough to arrange for Deb Shannon to come here from the Albany area, yes. Albany, New York area. Mm -hmm who is an expert in this area. She's a consultant on Ford Train Zone, probably among other things, I'm guessing. <laughs> and uh, she's going to uh, give us what I think will be quite a thorough presentation, and there'll be lots of opportunities for questions and answers uh, afterwards. Uh, if you haven't signed in, if you would please, over there, uh, for those of you who may be facilities at some point, the restroom is in the corner. Uh, there are some water uh, bottles there. There's also a drink with them, and then there's a vending machine out there for additional water. So without further ado, okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me here today. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and take you through this as quickly as I can so we have as much time as possible for your questions. Um, the uh, agenda for today is a very quick history of the program. It's important for the mindset of the Foreign Trade Zones Board to know that. And then we'll look at the benefits that you can have for warehousing and the benefits that you could have for, uh, for production activities. And then we'll do a couple of examples, one for warehousing, one for production. And then we'll look at what your next steps would be in feasibility for the zone and next steps would be applications and then questions. Okay. So the program was set up in 1934. Uh, what happened was we'd just gone through the depression and uh, there was a lot of protectionist activity going on in the United States. The Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act had increased tariffs on products, um, sometimes up to 120% over what they had been. And rather than helping the U.S. economy, what we saw was a steep reduction in jobs. Uh, up to 60% of the dock workers' jobs disappeared. And so uh, at the same time, we had uh, foreign interests saying, well, if the United States is going to increase tariffs, we're going to do the exact same thing. And we started a trade war. Um, the United States came up with the Foreign Trade Zones program as a way to try to get back some of the business it had lost. And originally, this program was really for warehousing-type activities. The idea was that ships were going into uh, Hong Kong and other ports. They were unloading, reloading onto other ships and going to their final destinations, transshipment activity. And the U.S. wanted that activity to come here. Well, as soon as a ship docked, you were to pay duty uh, on the goods that were on that ship. So the way to get around that was to create the Foreign Trade Zones program which would reduce the, or remove the duty on those goods that were then going back out again. It wasn't until 1950 that the United States decided to add manufacturing to the mix, but it wasn't very popular at the time. It wasn't until the 1980s when customs changed its regulation to say that if you manufactured in a foreign trade zone, you would only pay duty on the value of the foreign parts of the goods, not on labor, overhead, and profit, and things that you, you were adding to the, the cost uh, of your good. And so at that point in time, the program leapt in popularity. So here in 1970, before manufacturing really came on board with the change in customs regs, we only had 10 zones in the country, and they were all at deep water ports. 
Then by 2014, you can see we now have 293 zones across the country, 311 subzones, and subzones typically to this point have been mainly manufacturing hubs uh, for a single company. But you'll see this huge increase in jobs that we have within the zone and the, just the volume of goods coming through here. The Aberdeen Group did a report in 2014, um, and of, of the members, the 160 some odd companies that they interviewed, 53% were either going to increase their use of the foreign trade zone or get into the foreign trade zone within the next five years. Foreign trade zones are really being seen as the way for production uh, in this country to uh, to be on an equal footing uh, with international competitors at this point in time. But you'll see it's not all foreign parts. 64% of the materials that are used within a foreign trade zone are domestic in origin. Uh, we have three zones here in Vermont. Uh, most of you are probably in the Northeast Development Zone, which is 286, and you'll see it says ASF next to it. That stands for Alternative Site Framework, and we're going to discuss more about that when it comes to applications later on. The other two zones are in Burlington and Vancouver, and they're the traditional site framework. And it really uh, is a, uh, how the Foreign Trade Zones Board organized each of the zones. So what is a foreign trade zone? It's a, an area, usually right next to a port, that has been fenced, that is considered to be outside of the US Customs Territory for taxing purposes only. So it's still in the US, you're still responsible for any licenses or whatever you may have had on your product to this point. You still have to abide by all US wage and, uh, and labor laws. Um, but for customs purposes, the goods um, haven't arrived in the country at this point. Goods can go into this zone without a formal customs entry. Normally, goods hit the shore and a form gets sent to customs that says the goods have arrived and it says what the value of the goods are and how much tax is due and you pay your tax at that point in time. Here, you don't do that necessarily. You can have the goods go straight to the zone. No taxes are due at that point in time. Um, and the taxes that do become due may be very different to what you've normally had. And the reason this was established was to stimulate the international trade, as I mentioned previously. That is the mindset for the Foreign Trade Zones Board. If you're putting in an application to the board, they have an examiner that looks at every application to determine, is this going to stimulate the economy? Is there something in this for the US economy, not just for the company's profits? And uh, they, they want to see you know, that jobs are going to stay in the country that would have maybe gone overseas. They might want to see you're increasing jobs. They might want to see that um, without the zone, your product isn't competitive to foreign imports of the same type of product, and the domestic industry is struggling, but for this program, okay? And we've had many examples where companies would have gone bust, but for this program. So if you are doing warehousing activity, uh, there are several different benefits that you can potentially use with the foreign trade zone. The first one is that uh, you defer the payment of any duties and excise taxes uh, that you have. Um, you only pay once the goods leave your zone and go into the domestic market for consumption. So for some companies, that can be a year. It can be five years. It can sit in the foreign trade zone forever. There is no limit on the amount of time it can sit there before it comes out and into uh, the domestic territory and you pay those duties. If you brought your goods in through a, uh, a water port, we have the harbor maintenance fee that is payable. Usually you pay every time the goods hit shore. Here you pay them quarterly. So again, it's that cash flow thing. Uh, you uh, you maybe don't have to borrow money because you're, you're not paying it out right away. You can wait until you have a customer 
that is interested in the product before you send it out. It also eliminates duties on export. So if you are uh, a company that warehouses and then distributes overseas, any product that goes back overseas, you never pay any duty on. If you don't use this program, then you may be familiar with drawback, where you have to claim it and it can take six months before you see your money back from, uh, from customs. Uh, again, you don't have to do that on here. And uh, any of you that have anti-dumping countervailing duty products will know that those duties can be extremely high. And sometimes the government doesn't know exactly what the duty is going to be until two or three years after the goods have hit the shore. Here, as long as the product is shipped overseas, you never have to pay those anti-dumping countervailing duties. So say, for instance, you have um, uh, photovoltaic cells from China. You're not going to bring them into the US, but you store them here, and then you ship them maybe to Europe. As long as they go to Europe, you don't pay the anti-dumping way uh, uh, duty on those goods. It also eliminates duty on scrap. Um, if you have an industry where you have a high failure rate, uh, glassware, that comes in from overseas and uh, a certain percentage of it is always broken. Um, or you have um, uh, linens and things that can come in that um, have a problem with the, the weave. Uh, you can open up the product and you can examine it and you can scrap the items that don't conform or you can send them back to the manufacturer and no duty is payable on that. Typically, if you don't do this, when the goods hit the shore, you have to say what the value is at the time it hits the shore without any ability to look at it, and you pay the duty on that. So there's a savings there uh, for some people. Direct delivery uh, can be a huge savings option. Uh, instead of goods coming in, sitting at the port until it's examined by customs, you can request approval to bring the product straight to your facility with the custom seals intact. You then take the liability of checking the seals, opening up the cargo, making sure that it was what you originally asked for and in the quantity you asked for. At that point, you send your customs forms, your 214 to customs, and you take liability for that product. Um, this can really speed logistics. There are some companies out there that, uh, that find that their product gets held up a long time, and uh, this helps uh, with just-in-time inventory for them. Weekly estimated entry uh, is the product is sitting in the foreign trade zone uh, warehouse, and now you're sending it out to your um, uh, your uh, smaller warehouses or to the stores. And you may have 15, 16, 20 trucks going a day. Typically, you have to do, if you don't have this, you would do paperwork every time a truck went out to say, okay, this is now entering the US commerce, this is what it's worth. With this program, the weekly estimated entry, you pretend that all of those shipments are in one group. So you just keep adding up every truckload that went out for the entire seven-day period, and then you pay the, the taxes on that. And uh, at the same time, the, this, this is good for merchandise processing fee. Customs charges a fee for all products when it enters for uh, the work that they have to do on it. It's called the merchandise processing fee, and we'll go through it in a, in a few minutes. Some companies take the zone benefits just for weekly entry if they're doing a lot of turnover of the product. <clears throat> Warehousing benefits also include zone-to-zone -zone transfer. Um, so if you, for instance, are a, a supplier to uh, another manufacturer, uh, you're, you're in the automotive industry and you make gearboxes, and BMW is the ultimate uh, consumer of those, uh, those gearboxes. 
if BMW is in a foreign trade zone and you are in a foreign trade zone, you're bringing in your product from overseas, you're man uh, you can um, then transfer it to, um, to another zone without paying any duty on it. It will wait until BMW has made the final car and has sent it out into domestic market for the duty to be paid on it. Uh, so um, you can basically pass on the duty requirements to, uh, to another company. Usually what people find is that zone security um, is greatly improved over what your security may have been for your merchandise previously. Customs will require you to take a look at your site. They'll usually require fences. They may require someone, a, a guarded gate. They may require a keyless entry uh, tag thing. Uh, they'll require usually a name tag for everyone so that you, you know that the people that are on the foreign trade zone site are supposed to be there. And it is a felony offense to steal something that was in the foreign trade zone because duties haven't been paid to the federal government. And so because it's a felony, you find that fewer items tend to walk away uh, without you knowing about it. This also leads us to tighter inventory record keeping system. Customs wants to know what it was that you received, when you received it, and when it went out. And so you may find that you have to upgrade your inventory uh, control procedures, which may give you tighter record keeping. And the zone security together with the tighter record keeping can lead to lower insurance premiums um, uh, for your business. Storage of quota merchandise. Uh, some things um, have a, an annual limit on how much can be brought into the country. Because the foreign trade zone is considered to be outside of the US customs territory, in many instances, you can continue to bring those products in to the foreign trade zone even after the quota has been reached for the year. This can mean that you may be able to buy things cheaper because this, the demand isn't out there from all those other US firms that ha cannot bring in under the quota because they're not in a foreign trade zone. That means that you're ready to go as soon as the next quota year starts. Uh, and you can continue to bring in quota merchandise and ship it overseas at any point in time. Again, giving you a leg up over competitors that aren't using a zone but are shipping overseas. Remarking and relabeling of merchandise. Customs can have very detailed instructions for exactly what needs to be on a label, where the label needs to be located on products. And there are fines if it's wrong on products that are coming in from overseas. If you're using a foreign trade zone, Customs doesn't care what comes in on those labels at this point in time. You can take labels off and you can put new labels on. This is actually um, something that's really important for the pharmaceutical industry that may be producing drugs overseas and wants to ensure that the labels are written in very good English. So you bring it in and you relabel it in a foreign trade zone you don't pay any duty on that product while it's sitting in the zone. You get the opportunity to make sure that you're going to meet all of customs, FDA, and other requirements on those products before they go out into the U.S. market. So you avoid any potential liability there uh, for those uh, labeling issues. And then we have zone-restricted status. This is something that should be very rarely used. Uh, but... Um, Basically, you're saying once a product is in the zone, it will always be shipped out. It cannot be manufactured into anything. It cannot um, come back into the country. And only twice in the entire history of this program has the Foreign Trade Zones Board allowed a product that was listed as zone restricted to come back into the domestic market. Why is this necessary for warehousing? Well, maybe you don't use a zone very much but you have some big ticket items that you know are going to be shipped overseas to, uh, to a customer. 
but it may take you three or four or five years before that product is going to be shipped out. If you use a foreign trade zone to store that, as soon as it goes into the zone, you can apply for drawback and get any taxes and duties back that you've maybe paid on those items. Other than that, I probably wouldn't use zone restricted status. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, for production. The biggie for production is inverted tariff. You can bring in a product. Let's talk about the radio again. Radio has a tariff attached to it of, say, 10% duty on the value of that radio. But you manufacture it into a car in the foreign trade zone, and a finished car, if it came in from overseas, has a tariff of 2%. You can, determine, you can decide that you want to pay 2% duty on that radio instead of 5%. So as soon as it's manufactured into the new product, you get the inverted tariff. A biggie here is cell phones. A cell phone battery has a 25% tariff. A cell phone has zero. So you bring in a battery from the Philippines, you bring in a case from China, you marry the two together in the foreign trade zone, and suddenly you don't pay any duty on that item when you ship it out to the domestic market. Okay. Every single car manufacturer in the United States is in foreign trade zone. And that's why. Lower valuation. Now, we talked about this with customs changing their regulations in 1980. A foreign competitor who is importing a product has to pay duty on the entire value of that product when it hits the shore. You, if you're using a foreign trade zone, only pay duty on the foreign components. You do not pay it on any domestic parts that you added to it. You do not pay it on labor. You do not pay it on any overhead or any profits, only on the foreign parts. So now, here's your car coming in with a radio that was at 5% that's now at 2%, but you're not going to be paying maybe for... Um, any steel that you used in the body of the car. Maybe you're having your gearboxes done here. You wouldn't pay any duty on those either. Only the foreign parts. And it can be inverted based on whatever you've chosen. And we'll show an example of that later. You can also eliminate duty on exports. So you manufacture in the foreign trade zone here. You get the ability to say, made in the USA which can be big in certain parts of the world. And then you can export that product and not pay any duty on it. And because you didn't actually import it into the country at all, because it stayed in the foreign trade zone, you don't have to pay any of those uh, fees, the uh, merchandise processing fee, because it never came into the country. Zone-to-zone -zone transfer here is also important. If you are a manufacturer of a subcomponent in something else that another uh, manufacturer is using here, you can move it from your zone to the other zone uh, and not have a problem. Maybe you manufacture, but broken things go to another facility that you have somewhere else and you set that up in a zone too. You can move the merchandise back and forward without having to pay any duty, without it actually coming into the country. It goes by inbound carrier to the other zone, and then it can come back again. And you can do that as many times as you need. You can have foreign uh, companies send back broken things to you. It can go straight into the zone without any of that paperwork for the value of the broken item, without any of the drawback requirements. And you also get the same benefits that you had with warehousing on the weekly entry. So if you're manufacturing and bringing into the country and you're bringing in multiple shipments each week, you can take advantage of doing one entry and having the subsequent reduction in merchandise processing fee, which we're about to discuss, and the other benefits. So directly, what happens here? This is where merchandise comes into the port and instead of sitting there for customs to examine it, it moves 
on a bonded carrier um, straight to your facility without you having to tell customs that the goods have arrived. Okay, they do. You do that on a C two fourteen, right there. This is used to streamline logistics, and it can have major impacts on savings just on time alone. Um, the port director approves this if the merchandise isn't of a special classification. So certain things like plants, seeds, they have to look at. APHIS requires them to take a look at it when it hits the shore. If that isn't a requirement, then they can allow for direct delivery. Customs wants to know what you're doing ahead of time. Because you're in a foreign trade zone, Customs gets to learn a lot about your business before this happens. They know that you're not a terrorist bringing in guns. They know what you do, and it's stable over time. And so because it's predictable, you're a low risk, and they can allow this to happen. The one thing that has been a stickler to this point is that only the owner of the merchandise was able to apply for this. Now, if you're a manufacturer and you run your site all by yourself, you don't have a problem. But some places will hire a third-party logistics firm to run their warehousing and operations. And if the, uh, they become what's called the operator. The operator is not the owner of the merchandise and so cannot have direct delivery. Okay. Now, there's a little asterisk here. Watch this space. This has been uh, something that the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones has been arguing out with customs, and it looks as if this is going to change. And so it will be anyone in a foreign trade zone that is um, running the zone will be able to get direct delivery. We're hoping that's going to come down in the next six months or so. Weekly entry. Any company that wants it can apply to say that Within a seven-day period of time, all the cargo that comes into the country from the foreign trade zone will count as one entry. The company gets to pick the day that starts. For one company, it might be a Monday. For another company, it might be Thursday, starts the seven-day clock. And ahead of time, what you do is you tell customs how much merchandise you anticipate coming into the country and usually add 5%. Okay? Then as the week goes on, you check off the cargo until you reach your maximum that you put on that sheet. At which time you do a piece of paper to customs that says, it's a 7501, that says, here's our entry for the week, this is the value of the cargo, this is how much we owe you, here is our payment for our duty and our MPF. So if you're over on that original estimate, it doesn't matter. As long as it's not a blue sky estimate, Customs doesn't mind, you only pay duty on what actually came into the country. If you're under, then you have to do another estimate in addition, okay? This saves you money because it's a paperwork reduction. If you've got 20 loads coming into the country, that's 20 pieces of paper done by a broker who usually charges $100 per piece of paper. So if you're doing 20 and now you're doing one, there's your savings right there, just on the brokerage reductions here. But then we have this merchandise processing fee. Normally, when goods hit the shore, customs wants to know the total estimated value, the TEV, of the shipment. And then they charge you a fee of 0.3464% uh, of that value for processing your inventory. The minimum charge you'll get is $25. The maximum charge per load is $485. But you're doing one week. So it doesn't matter the value. The maximum you're going to pay on everything you brought into the country is $485 for that week. So here's an example. We've got 40 shipments coming into the country. They're coming into all deep water ports. We've got eight in Seattle. We've got 12 in LA. We've got 20 in New York. If you don't have a foreign trade zone, as soon as those shipments hit the shore, you now have to enter them with customs on 40 separate entries. 
each of those shipments, they'll look at the value. If it's $130,000 of value, you've reached your $485 max. So you're paying out uh, $19,400 in those 40 shipments if your cargo in each one of those shipments was $130,000 or more. Each shipment also has a harbor maintenance fee because they came into a water port of 0.125%, and that's due immediately. Now, you switch to the FTZ. There's no separate entries for those 40 containers that arrived at those ports. They just move by inboard tra transportation on IT, it's immediate transport to the FTZ. Nobody's looked at it. Customs hasn't looked at it. You're going to do that. You don't pay your merchandise processing fee either because it hasn't arrived. It goes into the zone. Now, let's assume that all 40 shipments then go straight out into the domestic market. Instead of having a separate MPF fee for each one of those shipments, you now have one for the entire week's worth of cargo, which saves you $18,915 a week. That's an annual savings of $983, uh, sorry, $983,580 over the year. And there are companies that save millions doing this alone. Without any savings on any duty, this is how they do it. And uh, the companies that tend to do this are those with high value merchandise or high turnover of merchandise. Um, so the distribution facilities, the Walmarts, the Targets, Caterpillar, they all use the zone and that's for the reason that they do that. And then instead of paying that harbor maintenance fee uh, immediately, you pay it on a quarterly basis. So you can plan for that and you've got some deferred um, payments uh, for cash flow purposes. So if we take a look at an example of a warehousing facility, this is a real life example. Um, this warehouse is bringing in plasma TV monitors and we're only looking at plasma TVs, we're not looking at anything else they're bringing in. They have a, um, every product you bring in is covered under the harmonized tariff schedule of the US. So there'll be uh, a product heading description, the heading's the first four numbers for the, uh, the category, and then as you get more detailed on the component, you'll add extra digits to the end. So this is the HTS US for plasma monitor. They're bringing in 60,000 monitors annually. Each monitor's valued at $1,000. That's uh, $60 million worth of product. The duty rate for those monitors is 5%. So annually, they're going to be paying 5% of the $60 million, which means $3 million tax burden. If they had to uh, pay this up front, and uh, uh, they, they had to borrow to cover this. They're looking at a 5% interest rate. Now, of course, that's going to vary depending upon where we are at, at the time. Um, so if they keep the product in the foreign trade zone for a full year, they don't enter it, they don't have to pay any of that duty. At 5% on this, they can save $150,000 a year on interest. So if we divide that annual savings by 365 days of the year, we get a daily savings for any un, um, for the uh, unentered merchandise of $411. Now, this company said that the monitors tend to stay in inventory for 120 days. So that would be 411 times 120 gives you $49,320 savings just on the duty deferral side of it. Then, they actually um, have another 10% of goods that they export, which is worth uh, six million. Then they have defects in products that have to be scrapped of 2%, so that's, uh, oh, that's another um, 1,200,000. ,200 so the total of the exports and the defect products is $7,200,000 uh, $7, of product that they haven't had to pay duty on because it's going to be either scrapped or sent out. 
So at the duty rate of 5% that we talked about for those monitors, that's an annual elimination, because they never have to pay this, of $360,000. Now, if you weren't using the zone, you could do drawback um, on those exported items, but it's going to take you six months to get the money back, typically, and you're not going to get the money back on the scrap. And then they go further, and they do the, um, the weekly entry. For those products that are coming into the country, in, um, they would normally pay $485 per entry uh, if the, uh, the truck uh, goods value is over 130000 Now, instead of doing four of those a week that was costing them $1,940, everything that comes in during the week period counts as one entry. And so it's $485, which gives them a savings of $1,455 each week. That's $75,660 over the year. They also would have paid a broker for every one of those entries each week, which would be for $100. Now they're down to one, which gives you an annual savings for a high turnover business of $15,600. The total savings over the um, uh, the duty deferral, the uh, export, the scrap, and the weekly entries comes out, and that's one product. So if this warehouse is Samsung, and they're doing monitors, refrigerators, um, ovens, dishwashers, whatever else you want to add there, this could be huge for them over all the products that they have. But still, I think if I went back to my boss and told them I could save them this in a year, they'd be pretty happy. Now, production. This can be even uh, better for companies. Before we go into it, though, we have to discuss some terminology. I'd mentioned that radio at 5%, and you could decide that instead of paying 5%, you want to treat it like a car and pay 2%. That's called non-privileged foreign status. The product comes in, and it loses its identity when you manufacture it. You get to choose whether you want to say that for each one of your components, or do you want some of your components to be what we call privileged foreign status. They retain their identity when you manufacture, because maybe they have a, du a lower duty rate than the finished item. So you don't want to pay more for that. You pay less by using the privileged foreign status. Then you may use parts that actually come from the US. They get listed as domestic status, so you don't pay any additional duties or benefit uh, taxes on that as, as the product moves through uh, your assembly line. And then we have the zone restricted status, which I'd already mentioned is usually a no-no. One thing that production might use this for, you're bringing on a new line and you have to bring in new equipment to manufacture that line. It's coming in from Germany. You can bring it in, not pay any duty on it, set it up, test it, and not till it goes into operation do you pay duty on it. That will be usually put into zone restricted status. It can never leave the zone. So production example, bicycles. If you bring in a bicycle from overseas, you will pay duty on that finished bicycle at 5.5% duty. In this case, the total value of the imported parts for this bicycle came out to $93.50. All the rest of the parts came from the US market, domestic in nature. And if you were to manufacture this in uh, the country, then you've got labor overhead and profit. They work out that that's what it's going to be for the labor overhead and profit. The finished bicycle's value to enter into the US would be $200. So if you were bringing in a $200 bicycle at 5.5% duty is what we're going to compare this foreign trade zone to. Okay, so you have a bicycle chain. The bicycle chain costs $5 for you to purchase it. When you bring it into the country, it has a zero duty on it. So 
the zero on the bicycle chain is less than the 5.5 you'd pay on the finished bicycle. So you're going to tell the uh, the Foreign Trade Zones Board that you want that to be in privileged foreign status. It's not going to lose its identity when you manufacture the bicycle. So it's in the zone, even when you manufacture it, and it leaves the zone and comes into the country for consumption, zero duty on it now, instead of what you would have paid uh, if you had uh, switched it up. Derailers, they come in at $17.50 each set. There's a zero duty on that. So again, that comes in as privileged foreign status. So in the foreign trade zone, you're not going to pay any duty on it when you've manufactured it into the bicycle. The frame, $35 for each frame. It's 3.9% to bring a frame in from overseas. And that duty would be a dollar and 37 cents on each frame. You're going to continue to put it in privileged foreign status because it's less than the 5.5% of the bicycle. So you're going to pay in a foreign trade zone when the bicycle's finished and enters the US market, a dollar 37 on it. Pedals though, pedals are 8% duty. So that we would put into non-privileged foreign status. We want it to lose its identity and become a finished bicycle at 5.5%. So here we have savings. Instead of paying 16 cents duty, we now pay 11 cents duty. And we keep going with all the parts that are foreign, deciding which status we want it to be in. And this will be in your application to the Foreign Trade Zones Board. Okay. For US parts, okay, we know what they're going to cost in total, but there is no duty because it's a US part. So it doesn't matter if you manufacture it into bicycle in the United States, you won't pay duty on it. And the labor overhead and profit, we've already said what it's going to cost us. Again, it's manufactured in the United States, so there's no duty owed on it uh, when you have the bicycle come into the domestic market. So assuming that each bicycle you produce comes into the U.S. for consumption, you are having a savings here. We go from $4.01 to manufacture that bicycle to $3.30 to manufacture that bicycle. Uh, in, this is in duty. So that's 71 cents. Now, if you're making 750,000 bicycles for the U.S. market and you've taken that inverted tariff benefit by making those things that cost more into the lower value item, then you've got a savings of $532,500 um, over the year. Okay? Then if you make another 50,000 bicycles for export, then you're not paying any of that cost that you would have had. So that's an additional $200,500 savings over the year. And so that's why companies use the foreign trade zone to manufacture articles. Now, we talked about production, and you, you tend to think about making things, big things like this. But the Foreign Trade Zones Board counts production as being anything that changes that harmonized tariff classification number at the six-digit level. So here you see... So you look at the first six digits. If it changes, then it's considered production. So you bring in wine glasses and you bring in a bottle of wine and you put them in a box and now it's a gift pack. Now it's not wine and glasses. It's got an entirely different code and so it's considered production. Okay? That can be a little screwy for people to understand. You have to look at each item. That's probably going to involve you looking to your customs agent to tell you what would it be if I brought it in from overseas in this situation versus what it came in as originally. Okay? I'm in this part of the country and I often hear, why should I bother with a foreign trade zone when we have NAFTA? Yes, Canada, largest trading partner. Hopefully it will continue that way with the change. Um, Mexico, also very big here uh, for trade. But if you are using NAFTA benefits 
and you want to use the foreign trade zone, consider it as if you were taking the warehousing benefits. So it's more deferral of what you're going to pay than elimination of what, what uh, the duty would be. Okay? <clears throat> if, now, normally, companies don't just manufacture to send things to Canada or manufacture to send things to Mexico. Normally, you're manufacturing for the domestic market, in which case you can maybe get that inverted tariff benefit for the product that's coming into the U.S. Or you're manufacturing also for other overseas clients that are not NAFTA, in which case you've got your duty elimination benefits. Um, but what we also find, though, is there are companies out there that say NAFTA is just too difficult. We have the origin requirements that we've got to go through. We've got to get all these certificates of origin from all the, the people that supply us, and it's a great liability, and we don't want to use it, in which case you can use a foreign trade zone. Now, the reason that you only get warehousing-type benefits is uh, the three governments got together and they realized that you could double dip, and they didn't want to do that. The idea here is that NAFTA helps provide jobs uh, in the U.S. and helps U.S. products. They don't want to help a product from Japan. So if when you were manufacturing, you used a component that came from Japan, they want you to pay duty on that product because it's not part of the free trade agreement. So the way it works is as it leaves the foreign trade zone, you declare the value of the foreign part and what the duty would be if you brought that uh, component into the country, that, just that foreign part. Not the whole value of the merchandise, just the foreign part. You then export your product to Canada. The Canadians may charge a duty on your product. It may not be duty-free. You will not pay uh, more than you would have paid in duty on the um, uh, on the foreign component. So if the Japanese component, and you have to declare the value of the full product when it hits, um, when it hits Canada. So if you've already paid more than you would owe for the, the uh, part from Japan, you don't owe anything. You just pay your Canadian duty. If the Canadian duty doesn't equal what you would have paid for the Japanese component to hit the U.S., you pay the difference to make it up, okay? So feasibility. There's several things that you should consider doing. The first is a quick analysis to determine whether there are savings for you. Uh, many of you have probably seen my zone calculator uh, where you would write in the information on each of the articles you're bringing into the country, what uh, the value of that is, what the turnover is, uh, and um, the duty rates, and uh, where, you're do where you're doing business. Is it going into the U.S. market? Is it going to NAFTA countries, or is it going elsewhere and export? That will give you a quick picture of what the potential savings are using a foreign trade zone. That will not, however, tell you what your costs might be. And so after you've done that, if it's looking good, the next step would be to go to a full cost-benefit analysis. And then we'll talk a little bit about consultants, whether you need them, when you should bring them in, and then your grantee and uh, customs involvement in, the, in this process. So a cost-benefit analysis is going to look at everything that you're importing. And what you need to consider early on is are any of the components subject to that additional duty for um, anti-dumping countervailing duty? Um, if I am not using an anti-dumping countervailing duty product right now because I'm buying from the Philippines and it's only China that has the anti-dumping, is there any possibility within the next five years or so that I might switch because the product is better or it might work out cheaper for what I'm doing especially if I'm going to ship it straight back out overseas. I'm not going to bring it into the country for consumption. Are there any quotas involved with the merchandise I'm bringing in? Okay. Are there any other licenses? If you have an FDA or a, an ATF 
um, requirement or any one of the other myriad agencies that are out there, you will still have to comply with that. But they often have participating government agency status with customs and they can streamline some of those procedures for you. But you need to know this up front because these may be red flags for you later on in this process. Then you want to know what the duty rates are for those imported parts. What is the total value of each of those parts that you're bringing in? How frequently are you bringing them in? And how much is coming in in each load? So how much are you paying in merchandise processing fees? You're also going to look at your domestic supplies. You may not know that your domestic supplier is already in a foreign trade zone. If that's the case, they can do a zone to zone transfer the duty doesn't get paid on that product uh, until it leaves the zone and comes into the US. So you might find that you have some savings by doing everything through a zone to zone transfer and FTZ, but you need to know, are your suppliers using an FTZ? If not, is it something they might want to get into? <laughs> and um, as part of that, are your suppliers actually using foreign components uh, in what they're making? for you. <clears throat> then you want to look at what your final product is that you're producing and what the duty rate would be if that product was brought in in its finished state from overseas. And then you're going to look at the exports. Where are you exporting to? Is there going to be any other issues such as NAFTA that you're maybe going to use instead uh, for some of the benefits? Are you not going to use that? How much are you exporting and how much comes into the US? Because it's going to depend on whether you're getting deferrals, inverted tariffs, maybe, or, or whether you're having complete duty elimination. And the frequency of the product coming into the domestic market to see if you can take advantage of weekly entry. Now, there are costs uh, of this program. And what I would suggest is that you do that quick benefit analysis first that's going to look at those things that we just discussed for the most part. And if you come up with a figure of savings of less than $100,000 in your first year, you probably don't want to go any further. Here's why. Now, it does vary from company to company. I, I have to say that. Some people will say, it doesn't matter what I save there just the fact that my logistics is so much improved and my inventory control is so much better, this is the way I want to go. Um, we did see that a number of companies with uh, the economic decline wanted any savings that they could get and so were willing to go lower. But I would suggest about 100,000 is the way you want to go because you may have to purchase software. Uh, you... Um, Maybe doing your uh, entries with customs manually at the moment. If you want to go with direct delivery and weekly entry, you will have to go uh, to uh, online um, access for that. You may also need to upgrade your inventory control software. You're going to have to tell customs how you're going to look at everything that comes in. Uh, um, Say you get a widget that comes in from three different countries. You may have three different duty rates. So how do you decide what you're going to use first? Are you going to do a lot number? So truck number one comes in, that's zone lot one. Number two comes in, that's zone lot two. You will use one before you use two. That is not, does not work in a foreign trade zone production environment where you may have 60 different things on a truck and you may need to get to other things. So, you know, you may have to go with a unique identifier number for each shipment, and then you can choose, are we going to do foreign out first? Are we doing first in, first out? Uh, are we just doing the unique identifier so we just put everything in one bin that has a uh, unique identifier number for that particular type of part, and customs doesn't care whether it was domestic or if it came from Japan, because as long as the numbers add up, they're going to charge duty on whatever goes out until you've used up whatever would have been foreign. OK? 
Okay. Um, but there's software for that. So if you can't do it in-house, you may have to purchase software. Then we have personnel. You're going to need someone who's going to be your zone expert. And usually customs wants you to have a backup because if you're out uh, for a vacation or medical leave or something, they want to know that there's someone that knows what they're doing that's in charge of that. You will have training. The Zone expert is going to need ongoing training. And um, I would suggest that they join the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones because that is the only organization that provides ongoing training in foreign trade zones. And it provides access to all the federal agencies as well. Uh, they come to all the conferences to answer questions. Um, <clears throat> you're also going to need to train your personnel on the ground. Your warehousing staff need to know where the foreign trade zone starts, where it ends. They're going to need to know whatever your inventory system is going to be for those products. And um, if customs, when customs comes to audit, they have to know how to treat customs. You can't ask customs to leave their gun at the front desk. Uh, so, you know, there, there is ongoing training requirements that's going to cost you some money. Customs will ask you to get a bond. Uh, $50,000 is the minimum bond. In reality, 100000 is their minimum that they usually ask for in a bond. That's because you've got merchandise in there that potentially has duty owed to the federal government. They want to make sure they get the money. So they'll ask for a bond. If you are a member of the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones, you get 20% off of your bond price through um, one, one of the insurance companies that's a member because they feel you're less of a risk to the bond because you're going on with your training and so you know how to operate the zone correctly. So they can do that. <laughs> Security may need to be upgraded. You may have a fence now, but maybe you don't have badges for everyone that comes in and a visitor sign-in log and a badge for them. Uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe you don't have doors that automatically lock in the area. Maybe you're going to need signage. When customs comes out to talk to you, and they will as part of this application process, they're going to do a walk around your facility. They'll want to know what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you expect to do it in the foreign trade zone. They will tell you at the time what it is they need in the way of security measures, and it's based on the type of product you have, how likely it is that product can leave your facility without you knowing about it. So if you've got a warehouse full of gloves, it's very easy for them to leave. If you've got a giant generator, it might be a lot more difficult for that to leave without someone seeing it. So that might be less of a risk. But maybe those parts for the generator cost a lot more and have a lot more duty owed than a pair of gloves would have. So they have to balance what the risk is in it leaving and what the product is worth to the US government to make sure that it's safe. So that will determine what they do with security. <clears throat> You'll also have an annual fee. Um, to join the zone, you have to apply to your grantee. Uh, if you're in northeastern Vermont, it's going to be Dave. Um, <clears throat> the zone, of course, ooh, ooh, that's good. there we go. Um, the zone has, um, uh, has fees associated with it. Dave has to get continuing education. Dave has to market the zone. Uh, Dave has an annual report that he has to do to the Foreign Trade Zone Board that he talks to all of his... Uh, Subzones and uh, users about. Um, let me get to the right place again. Okay. And so um, each of the zones is able to charge a fee, and um, they can charge uh, you the full cost of what it costs to actually run the full zone for them, and they divide it up amongst their users. That fee will be listed in the uh, zone schedule that each zone has, and uh, Dave can give you access to that. It shows you all of the policies and procedures that the zone has, as well as the fees. 
You'll have maybe a fee for the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones. Um, you may be renting software or you may have a consultant that's going to uh, be assisting you. So you may have fees for that uh, that I would count under annual fees. There's an annual report that has to be completed for customs at the end of the year uh, that looks at your inventory. Uh, it's a reconciliation report. So, of course, there's going to be time and effort taken in doing that inventory assessment, making sure that all the numbers add up and getting that report to customs. At the same time, there's a lesser report that goes to the Foreign Trade Zones Board. It would go through your grantee, um, telling them how much stuff you had in the warehouse at the beginning of the year, how much you had at the end, and what the what kind of products were coming in and going out and the value of those products. And if you're manufacturing, what was the profit and overhead roughly? Uh, the Foreign Trade Zones Board uses this to do an annual report to Congress that shows why the program's justified. That One of those first slides I showed you showed you how the zone program had changed over the years and it showed you how many jobs we had in the US and how much was domestic material and how much product was going through the zones. That all comes from that annual report that everyone sends in. It's consolidated and it goes to the federal government to keep the program going. And then, of course, you'll have an annual audit. Customs will come in once a year. Uh, they can come in more than that. They can come in when they choose to come in, but they usually do an annual review with you to go through and make sure that everything's in its place. If you will have a zone manual that you'll, you'll have all of your policies and procedures for how you run the zone, They'll want to look at that. Any updates that have been done to it, they want to make sure those updates are there. They'll want to make sure that your staff know about those updates. So they'll question them, which is why we go back to that training. So consultants, do you need them? Consultants can be useful. The Foreign Trade Zones Board will tell you that you don't need a consultant to help you write an application. And they are, they are correct to an extent. They can be valuable to you up front. First of all, the cost-benefit analysis. Um, if you have one of those red flag issues, anti-dumping, countervailing duty, quotas, licenses, um, then you might need to talk to, say, a zone attorney. There are foreign trade zone attorneys out there that uh, can be very familiar with the nitty-gritty of where the board has been going with its decisions on those items. And um, so they can, they can be very helpful to you deciding in a cost-benefit analysis, do you want to put a certain item into the zone or not? You know, you can pick and choose. You don't have to do all of your operations. When you do an application, you have to put in everything it is that you want to do. Some of these folks have been around the block with certain industries many times. And they might say, well, what if you did this? And you might not have thought about it, but it might save you some money. And so paying for a consultant up front who can go through those scenarios and make sure you considered, is my supply chain where it needs to be? Should I be using a different country instead? Might I use them in the future? Um, <clears throat> because you have to say what it is you bring in, where it's coming from. So <clears throat> they could be useful. Application writing itself, one of the, the first application for your site is so simple, it's, it's laughable. It's 11 questions. Name of the company, address of the company, who owns the site, what's it zoned for, produce a map for the site. Um, uh, do you agree that you will work with customs on um, computerizing the uh, the zone and customs procedures. Um, is use of the site um, contingent upon getting foreign trade zone status? Uh, what is it you make? What do you want to do? I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell in this application. So apart from the what is it you make now versus what you want to do five years' time, which a consultant might help you with, um, what is it that you want to do with the zone, which you can do by yourself, or you can get a consultant? Those questions are pretty simplistic, and I think anyone in this room could probably answer them uh, without getting, uh, getting assistance. For some of the 
production notifications and things. Maybe you do need a consultant depending upon how technical it's going to get. Some of these consultants also offer their own software and other products. And so uh, you might want to consider that up front um, so you've got a seamless system going. Now you can find a consultant by asking your grantee for names. You can go to the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones. They have a site set up that breaks down consultants by the type of services that they offer. Or what I would highly recommend is if you're interested in a foreign trade zone, you actually attend a conference. You can attend it without being a member. You can attend the sessions to learn more about the zone, and they do a huge amount of networking. And you get to ask the attorneys and everyone else present what if questions, and they don't charge you a penny for it. And that also gives you a chance to go out there and see which consultants you like, which ones you might want to hire, which ones you want to avoid. So I would highly recommend a conference. Paying a little bit of money up front can pay dividends later on. Now, your grantee is really important in this process uh, because your grantee has to submit the application and they have to write a letter saying they approve it. So to let them know ahead of time that you're interested is really a good idea. They can also interest, uh, in introduce you to the port director. Now, the port director has to also write a letter that has to go in with your application saying, yes, they approve of this, yes, it can be done. The more they know you up front, the more comfortable they are with what's going on. And if you're asking for weekly entry and direct delivery in your application, which you would have to do if you want it, it's nice that Customs already knows you and are ready to give you that. The other reason that they might um, be good to know up front is a lot of companies will come in and say, Okay, I've decided I want the zone. I need it yesterday. You have to go through an application process. You're going to be putting in an application for the site, and then if you're doing production, an application to do production. The board can take 120 days to, to look at that production application, but they can give you temporary interim authority if Customs says they're ready to go now. So in 30 days, instead of 120 days, they can give you authority to get moving on it. <clears throat> to do that, customs needs to be on board. You need to be working on the security and everything else, the policies and procedures, so that you can also pass your customs application at the same time. Okay. Applications. Now, <clears throat> everyone would do an application to designate the site. Which, type, which application you would do depends upon whether you're in an alternative site framework, northeastern Vermont, or you're in a traditional site framework, the other two zones in Vermont. And I'll show you each one separately. But they're all straight forward, okay? It comes down more to a timing issue on these things than it does um, the questions. They all, for that site, have basically an 11-question application. If you then want to manufacture in a zone, you have to do what's called a production notification letter. The Foreign Trade Zones Board has a list of questions in a Word file online. You put it on your letterhead and you answer the questions. And there's a table you fill out with the products you want to bring in, what ones you want to be preferred foreign status, which ones you want to be not preferred foreign status, etc. And that all goes in a production notification letter talking about your company. They have 120 days to review that. It has to go on the Federal Register so that other companies and interested citizens can respond to it. After 120 days, they will say, yes, you're approved, or no, you're not. If you're approved, then you move to the next step, which would be an activation application with customs. If you're not approved, then you have the option to go in and do a production authority application. Now, this is a bigger application where you have to look at your entire industry. How would you maybe harm or not harm the domestic industry if you were using the foreign trade zone? Will it hurt suppliers? So anti-dumping countervailing. If there's a U.S. company that produces the same item that that foreign company produces, are you going to make them bankrupt 
if you're using anti-dumping countervailing from somewhere else. So you know best your industry. You know best what's the lobbying like. If you've got a product that has a lot of union activity and lobby activity against it, um, then you're more likely going to have to go with a production authority application. And for my money, I would go with a foreign trade zone attorney to help you with that. Okay? But you, everyone starts with a production notification letter, um, which takes 120 days. So, <clears throat> warehousing would just do an application for the site. And then if it's approved, you go straight to an activation application with customs, where you look at security, inventory, background checks, bond, and all the procedures for your zone. Okay, That has to be approved before you can actually use the zone. If you are production, then you do an application for the site, you do a production notification letter, you can at the same time start your activation application with customs if you want to get moving on it quick. If this is approved, then you continue with your application for production and you start. If the production notification is declined, then you can go straight to the production authority application, which is going to take longer, and then the activation application. So if you're in uh, northeastern Vermont uh, zone, 286, these are the counties that are covered. The most Often used application, the one I suspect you'll all use, is a usage-driven site subzone application, the 11 questions. There's no fee to send this in to the federal government, but you must have customs sending in their comments at the same time, and the grantee must send in their uh, agreement to you uh, using the zone, and you get a decision within 30 days. This this is a big change for the Foreign Trade Zones Board. This used to take four to six months. Okay. Production notification letter can be done at the same time as the usage-driven site subzone application. And again, there's no fee for it. You're just going to tell them exactly what it is you want to do. And they have 120 days to review that. If you have to go to the next stage, if that's declined because there's been a big lobbying effort uh, that says, you know, there might be some other issues here, you, you, need to dis uh, you need to get more information, then you can go to the production application, which is going to look at your whole industry. And this may require a hearing in Washington. Um, and it can take nine to 12 months for them to reach a decision on this. Again, there's no application fee for doing this. If you're in one of the other two zones here, again, you, well, in this stage, you do a subzone application. There's no usage-driven site. It's subzone application. It's those same 11 questions. But because this is um, something that harkens back more than 20 years, they have to charge a fee they charge you $4,000 to $6,500 to apply, and it depends on how many products you're using. So if you're using less than four products, you'll pay $4,000. If you're using more than four, you'll pay $6,500 to apply. Okay? It used to be that subzones were only for manufacturing, and so the fee was really for, for doing a manufacturing application. But now subzones are used for warehousing and everything else, and they didn't want to go back and uh, have to change the, the fees because it requires lots of government agencies getting involved. So again, Customs has to send in their comments, and this time it's three to five months for a decision. The reason is that Northeastern Vermont said that they could set up a zone anywhere within their five counties, and so the public comments came in on that entire area. The older zones didn't do that. They did it for specific sites, so when you put in an application for your site, it has to go in the Federal Register and it has to be public comment on whether your particular site is okay in the zone. So that's why it takes three to five months. Production notifications, again, same exact thing it was before. 
explaining the components, and it's 120 days just as it was for northeastern Vermont. And it's the same thing again for the production application if you have to go that way. So that's it. I did include some definitions of who's who within the foreign trade zone um, and uh, some of the terminology that gets used in the zones. gave you a table for each of, uh, well, for Northeastern Vermont and for the other two zones on what each of the fees are and how long it takes for each of the different types of applications. It's a lot of information to give you in a short period of time. Uh, real quick to Canada, NASA, yeah, real quick to come. So, does the double dipping apply really to the manufacturing model, not the warehousing model? If you're just warehousing apart, if you're warehousing apart, that will be declared as a say in Canada. You're warehousing it here in the US, you're shipping it to Canada. You will pay whatever the Canadian charge is for that Japanese delivery, as if it came from Japan. Not as if it came from the US. There was no US manufacturing, no US or NAFTA origin for that part. If you are producing something using that part from Japan, you will enter your product um, into the US for shipment to Canada. On that paperwork, you put down the part that's from Japan, the value of that part from Japan, and the duty that would be payable if you were to ship that part from Japan straight to the US. Okay? Then you will put down the total value for the manufactured product for Canada. Canada will then assess any duty they have on your finished product. If the duty that you pay to Canada for your finished product is more than the duty you would have paid for the Japanese component in the US, you don't pay anything. If the duty owed to Canada is less than the duty that you would pay in the US for the Japanese component, you pay the difference, okay? So you end up paying two. You pay the US for the difference and you pay Canada for its duty on whatever the product is. So you don't get out of it. You also have to pay your merchandise processing fee. So you know, um, it's, it's usually is, it's equivalent to warehousing. You're getting get a deferral of the duty and the savings that that may entail with not having to borrow money and being able to 
warehouse it until you actually have a buyer for the product and not pay the duty until you, you're getting paid, rather than you're getting inverted tariff benefits that you would get if you were, um, <clears throat> if you were uh, producing for the domestic market or total elimination of duty that you would get if you were going to someone, somewhere that wasn't NAFTA. Okay? Does that explain it a little bit? It's a very tricky area. Um, NAFTA is just one of those screwy things. How would you reporting for the weekly if we chose to do the reporting? How would you report that as it was released to the domestic market? And let's just say it was warehousing models, so you just are sending that exact piece from Japan as it was a tariff shift to Canada. You have two different forms. You have a 7501 for entry to the domestic market. You have a 7512 for export. And so the Canadian part would be 7512. And it would list out what the value of the part was. Okay. I just want to verify what I think is the case. If any of the companies represented in this room, which are located within the, the Northern County area that is part of Dave's love, if you wanted to apply, I believe you fall under Category 3, so you don't pay a fee. Correct. For the site. Right. Yes. Uh, but the, uh, there's this four to 6,000 thing, the designated subzone. What that would be is if someone wasn't in the five county service area but wanted, wasn't in any other foreign trade zone either and they went to Dave and said, we need the foreign trade zone, can, you use, can we put our site in your zone? Dave might be able to say yes and if he does, then you have to go through a subzone application um, which is going to take longer because the area that you're in was never approved on the federal, you know, the comment period on the federal register when Dave did his application. And so it has to go through that whole process. And because it's an old style subzone, this goes back to the traditional site framework regulations, you then have to pay the fee depending upon how many products are involved, how many components are involved. Um, so, you know, that's just a, a little outside thing. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so that would be somebody who's, out, who's in Vermont, let's start with, and who's outside of the northern counties and not in Bennington or Broward. If you're in Bennington or Brattleboro, you go to the Brattleboro and Burlington site, and here you have to designate a subzone and you have to pay the fee. And that's because the old style applications would, wouldn't have a service area. Instead, the application said, we want a site at this location, this location, and that location. And it went from the Federal Register to just look at those very specific areas. So any time a new site gets added, they have to go back to the Federal Register and do the application all over again. Next. Yep. Uh, earlier, I asked you a question about uh, we have a couple of manufacturers that manufacture components for our customer, and I, the question I've come up before is: Is it better for the manufacturer of the component to apply for foreign trade zone participation or the the end company? Okay. It's going to depend upon your circumstances. But if you are a contract manufacturer, uh, presumably you have more than one client. Presumably that means that you may have products that uh, you could use foreign trade zone procedures on for more than one client. In which case, yes, you most definitely, if you can save the money, get in the foreign trade zone program yourself. If your client is... Um, is manufacturing using your components that have gone through the foreign trade zone program and they may be importing other components as well and manufacturing a final product, they may also want foreign trade zone designation, in which case you could do the zone to zone transfers. 
Okay? Now, the reason that we now have the production notification letter, instead of going that full production authorization six, uh, nine to 12 month route, is strictly because of those um, uh, manufacturers that are um, making different components here and there for, for different, uh, they're doing contract work. And they had such fast turnaround that they couldn't afford to wait the nine to 12 months for the foreign trade zones to give the blessing. So the board decided to allow this quick uh, 120 day application procedure. And if you're already in the zone, you know, you've gone through it, you've already got approval for certain contract manufacturing, and another uh, contract comes down the line that produces something that's slightly different, you can put in another letter and you can request that expedited interim uh, procedure because you've already gone through activation of customs. Customs doesn't really have anything more to do there. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can get that temporary uh, approval and then wait the 120 days for the full approval to come. The temporary is only granted if you are already activated or you can activate within 30 days. Um, and it's a product that the Foreign Trade Zones Board has a kind of a history with, so they know it's not going to be a product that lobbyists are going to start complaining about. Okay? Um, but uh, that's definitely worth it uh, for you. Being able to pass on those duty payments to someone else down the line is, is definitely good for you. But you also want to go back to that, what are my savings going to be? What's my threshold within my company? Is it going to be that 50000 is good, that we've got all the in-house personnel we need and, and really it's not going to cost us that much? Or do we want to go more towards that $100,000 worth of first year savings before we decide to jump in on the foreign trade zone? You have to weigh those things. And it's different for every company. I can't tell you what to do. Um, I can tell you that typically 100000 is around the threshold for most companies. Sorry, I forgot that. You asked me to put that one in and I forgot. That's okay. Uh, just another question. I want to ask the questions that I've heard from other companies. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so, another question that we hear is we have a large manufacturer and they bring in a, a foreign component into the secure approved area that comes to the sign off on in the facility. But at some point, that component needs to come out into the, the uh, facility for processing. Uh, are there special requirements that uh, they have to do to? You can get approval for temporary removal of an item. Um, so they will allow you to do that. Um, for instance, silverware manufacturing. Uh, you produce the knife and fork, but then it needs polishing. Sometimes polishing gets done in another facility, but it comes right back again. Sometimes customs will approve that. Sometimes they'll say, why don't we just incorporate that area into the foreign trade zone as well. Um, so, you know, it will vary depending upon what it is you're doing. Um, if it goes out of the zone, um, you know, customs, uh, uh, customs has paperwork that they'll ask you to, to fill out on that. So they know, they want to know where the product is at all periods of time. So when they do their annual audit, they want to they see your uh, admission to the zone documents, they want to see that you've got the quantity that you had and you've used the quantity you said you've used, that you don't have overages or underages, because you, you, know, you need to report those uh, to customs. It's, a, it's an ongoing relationship. So if you find that something's missing, you need to let customs know about it because you know there's some duty that may be owed on that product now it's missing. So uh, it's, it's definitely you're going to get into a relationship with customs where um, you're going to be talking to them on a fairly regular basis uh, back and forth about what's going on with your business. It's very different from a company that's just <coughs> bringing in product as soon as it hits your store you pay everything and then you don't have to worry about customs again. Here because the duty hasn't been paid customs wants to know what's happening with that product until it, it leaves the zone and duty's been paid. So on that subject, say you're bringing a component uh, out of the result of the 
and something happens and the water wasn't paying attention. So that scrap, and we said that the scrap that comes over, we don't have to pay off. Right. But if we produce the scrap, then it still has to be allocated and still pay. Yeah. Um, some, um, you bring in a certain type of plastic and you, um, uh, you use a cutter to make a shape, and then you've got a piece of plastic that's now scrap. It's now scrap. You don't pay duty on that piece that you got rid of. It must have zero value to it, okay? So if you've taken it out of the zone for some kind of processing, you had approval to do that, it goes back into the zone in whatever status it's in. At that point, it's scrap. You report it to customs as scrap. Uh, customs may want to be on the premises when you destroy it. Okay, if you sell it to someone, the scrap, if there's any residual value to it, you have to pay duty potentially on that scrap uh, because the idea is scrap is scrap. Uh, but otherwise you can get rid of it or if the part broke because of something else that was done by one of your overseas suppliers, you could ship it back there if you wanted to rather than scrap it and not pay the duty on it. Do the majority of the members of the corn trade in Vermont or the local area use a, a small section of the warehouse or do they use their whole warehouse for their corn trade? Is there some way to gauge what's best, what's best practice for? It's, it's what's best for you. Now, there are some places where they put their entire facility on, but Customs has access to everything that's foreign trade zone. Do you want them in charge of your water supply? Do you want them in charge of your electrical supply? Probably not. So do they need to be in the offices? Probably not. Many zones use square footage of activated space to determine what your fee is going to be to your zone. So if you know that there's certain areas that are not going to be used, then you don't include them in your foreign trade zone. Now, if that is partway through a warehouse, you may have to have signage on the floor, FTZ. So anyone know, knows that they cross that line, they're now in the FTZ, and now they have to follow FTZ procedures. Are they allowed in that zone? Do they have the correct clearance for that zone? So, you know, customs will tell you when they come in and they'll, they'll want a blueprint uh, of your building they'll want you to mark out on it. You'll mark out for the Foreign Trade Zones Board and you'll mark out for, uh, for customs with red ink the area that's going to be included. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not worth putting in space that you know you're not going to need. But if you know that on quite a few occasions a part has to move from here to there, then rather than go through the rigmarole of getting permission to move it out of the zone and then move it back in the zone, why not just include that area? So Dave, how do your zone schedule, uh, how do you apportion these? It's on the square footage. Right, square footage. Under 10,000 is one feet above 10,000 is the other. So it's just two materials. So what happens to containers if they're bringing in container goods and each year's goods? And each container is mixed. So I have some product in there that I want to put in the trade zone as soon as it hits, and there's some product in there that I know is going to put in the market, period. Mm -hmm. How do you report that? Can you report that? Can you do that? You can. Um, you make it more difficult for yourself if it's not all just going into the foreign trade zone. If it's going to the domestic market anyway, you can get the deferral on your duty by having it in the foreign trade zone and then taking it out only once it's sold. So, you know, if you've got a product there that is definitely going to the domestic market, but it's going to sit for six months, why not let it sit tax free for six months? On well, customs and border protection for all, uh, it's my understanding of these public support too is that uh, they look at site security and inventory control, but they don't have any specific requirement as to the kind of system to use for inventory control. They want to know it's going to work. That's the big thing. So. Um, you know, there's usual systems that, that are in place, like every truck load, everything that's in that truck is considered a lot. And so you have to take it in lot order. 
uh, which, which can be absolutely ridiculous in a, in a production environment because you've got all different components in that lot. Um, most production environments are going to go with a unique identifying number for each thing, a SKU for each part. Then it's your choice. Is it going to be first in, first out? So you know what, which order everything comes in, which means in the warehouse, if you've got one widget that comes in from three different places and they put them in that one location, the warehouse guys need to know you can't just take the first one. You have to take the one we tell you to take. So, um, you know, if the thing from China came in first, but the domestic thing is in the front, they can't, because they're going on break, just take the domestic. They have to move the domestic and find the one from China and use that first. So that's first in, first out. A better way, probably, is to say we use a unique identifier for the part, but we don't care which country it comes in from. It's all going to go in one box, and we'll assume that it's foreign out first. So, you know, you've got 50 radios from five different countries. It doesn't matter if it was the US, the, the Chinese, the Philippine, or the German radio that came out first. Customs will look and say, you had 50 radios, you sent out three. How many do you have left in that inventory bit? That's probably the best way for production to look at how they're going to do their inventory control. So, do you have unique identifiers on the products? Do you have a way of scanning for them? Can you show what product came in, each of the countries listed, the value of it, the duty for each country, what went out total, and the duty you're going to pay on that? And Customs doesn't care because they're going to get their money first. Anything else? This is an easy audience. <laughs> I do know, just speaking for customs in our area or our, our zone, uh, we've had uh, multiple conversations with them. They've not been responsive up until lately, but now they have a trade person, whereas before we had a lot of reports that we were dealing with. So now there's a foreign trade specialist uh, on the customs staff at the Dirty Line Port, which is our center. So they, they've all along agreed to serve the entire Fort County region, but now they have someone who's a little more familiar with the program. Yeah, as part of your activation application, it's going to be telling customs, hey, we're here, this is what we manufacture, this is what we use, this is kind of what we want to do. Customs comes out, they look around, they say, okay, well, you've got to have signs here, signs there, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. What kind of inventory do you have? Um, tell us what you want to use, show us how that's going to work. They need to be comfortable up front that what you have in place is going to work. And um, they'll do background checks on um, the, uh, the top members of the company and those that have control over inventory, you know, purchasing department. They'll look to the head person for that and they'll do background checks on them because uh, they don't want anyone uh, you know, that's uh, been convicted of a felony uh, in charge of something that uh, affects duties payable to the US government. Um, they will expect some kind of a binder from you of all your procedures, which is going to cover that inventory system you're using. Uh, it's going to show everything from the moment the ship hits the dock, how does the product work through the system? When it comes into our warehouse, where does it go? Who gets notified of what? Who's in charge of what? What happens if we have an underage? What happens if we have an overage? Who reports it? And they'll want to make sure that, that is kept up to date. Once you meet customs' requirements for that and they say, this looks good, they'll approve you for activation. Now, normally what happens is after activation, the company says, we're going to do a test run. Make sure that everything works the way we say it's going to work. So we'll pay the duty, we'll do everything we would have normally done, but we're also at the same time going to run it through our new system and make sure that everything checks out in the end. And Customs likes that, they like to go through it with you uh, to make sure it's good. And then once you're done, once you're comfortable that the testing has worked, then you move on to full use of the foreign trade zone. What's the most common problem that a company runs into when they become part of one of the zones and 
what's the common mistake that gets made by companies when they're nine months, a year into the process? Is it reporting? Is it? It, it comes down to that um, the customs paperwork, when it gets done, uh, how it gets done, uh, issue. Um, so, so you've given a list of items to the Foreign Trade Zones Board and to customs of what you're bringing in. Someone in purchasing says, well, I can find it cheaper somewhere else, and they just go and do it, and they don't tell the Foreign Trade Zone person. And now you have a problem, because now you're bringing in something in that you weren't proved to bring in. It may be the same item, but it's from a different country, and it has a different duty rate. And it might have anti-dumping or other issues associated with it, and nobody's told the foreign trade zone rep at your facility. And when they find out, there's a problem. Or someone takes something out of the zone to repair it and brings it back in and doesn't think anything about it, and 10 months down the line, the foreign trade zone rep finds out that, oh my god, we've been doing this procedure, we've been doing it a long time, and we've never been approved to do this procedure with customers before. Okay? Those are the things that come up. If you do it, you have to have a foreign trade zone expert. It's, customs is going, when they do their audit, they're going to say, well, who's the backup? And they're going to want to make sure that person who's the backup knows what they're doing too. So that any questions that arise during your warehousing or production um, uh, business, there's someone there that can answer the questions all the time. Okay? And, and it's a different procedure. You've got to get everybody on board. Uh, the CEO, the CFO, the purchasing department, they all need to know who the foreign trade zone person is, and they need to know that if they're going to start a new product line, they're going to bring something new in, or there's uh, a problem in the warehouse that everything needs to come back to the foreign trade zone person. So when you're sitting down initially to do your, your manual for customs, you're going to want those people in the room. How does it work in this department? How does it work? What are we going to put in place as a new procedures? How are we going to make sure everyone does that? And then make sure you train everyone in that department and you keep the training going so as you have attrition and new hires, that the new hires also get that information. Okay. Those are the biggest things. In getting approval for a product, is a hat a hat, or does it get down to a much more micro level that you know, we've said and said we are going to be you know, we've hat from Nepal. It might be, is it a man's hat, a boy's hat, a woman's hat, a girl's hat? Is it knitted? Is it leather? Does it have fur? You know, these are all different classifications. The HDS code, all, the HDS code is what needs to be defined and yes. approved. Yes, okay. and that's where your customs person is going to come in. Now, you go to an outside customs agent and you say, hey, we've got this idea, we want a foreign trade zone. They're going to say, no, really bad idea, don't do it. Because they get $100 every time they put in a piece of paper for you, and now suddenly they're going to potentially see their money drop because now you're going to do your weekly entries, you're doing your direct deliveries. You know, customs are probably not going to be too happy with you for that. Depends on who you have. They're going to find other ways to work with you, to do business for you, um, other services that they can provide. So there is still a role for the customs broker. It's just not the same role they've had all this time. Anything else? Good day. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, good luck. Thank you.